Ganeshangas were an alternative polity to kingdoms which had its root in an earlier system. There is a connection between Ganeshanga type of polity and the new religious reformation which we find in the 6th century BC. It is interesting to note that both Buddha and Mahavira belong to the Ganeshanga type of polity. Their clans actually followed the non-monarchical system of polity in early India. What is interesting is that the sources that we have for the Ganeshangas are varied, but the Brahmanical sources are completely silent about the functioning of the Ganeshangas. It is only Panini who refers to the Ganeshangas as a passing reference when he is explaining the grammatical rules. But it is the Buddhist texts which actually gives us a detail on the functioning of the Ganeshangas and talks about the methods in which the Ganeshanga type of polity ruled in the early Indian scenario. As we all know that in 6th century BC, we had a very strong monarchical state system with the rise of the Mahajanapadas and with the rise of certain territories like Magadha, Anga, uh, Koshala and others. But the Ganeshangas actually were no less important and we have very important Ganeshangas called the Vidji, which is also referred to as the Vrijian Confederacy. But if we look at the location of the Ganeshangas, we find that these Ganeshangas were located not in the middle Ganga plains, but they were normally located in the peripheral area in the foothills of the Himalayas or farther south or in the northwest and sometimes in the eastern part of the territory. So the reason behind this location perhaps was that they did not want to be a part of the original orthodox heartland of the Ganga Valley. They had their own system of functioning and they were outside the Varnashram Dharma. And this is one of the reason why the Buddhist texts talk of the Ganeshangas, whereas the Brahmanical texts are completely silent about them. In fact, it is interesting to note that the Brahmanical texts decry these Ganeshangas as degenerated Kshatriyas and often they call that they are also Shudras. And when we look at the teachings of Buddha, we find that Varnasrama did not form a part of Buddha's teaching and when he was talking of the social order, he always ranked the Kshatriyas on top of the Brahmanas. So this was the reason why the Branaganashangas did not get any firm footing in the Brahmanical literature. As far as the functioning of the Ganeshangas, we have the Vrijian Confederacy in the 6th century BC, where we have that they were different kinds of clans. But all these clans ruled independently. And sometimes they had their own independent point of view. But when their a decision had to be taken, it was through an assembly. The term Gono, it actually means a group of people. And when the term we, uh, Shangho is added to it, we mean it means an assembly. We have also another term called Gonorajyo, which meant governance. So these Gonorajyos were used to a kind of polity where you have governance by a cluster of people and not a rule by a single monarch. Now this type of uh, polity has been explained in different ways by the historians of early India. We can cite the example of a nationalist historian, K.P. Jaiswal, who has actually talked of this Ganeshanga type of polity as a form of democracy in early India. This view has of course been questioned because if we think of democracy, we find that the, in the Ganeshanga, it was the group, certain group of people who actually ruled. So it was not a very democratic way of functioning and the opinions of the common people was not taken into account. So in no way we can say that Ganeshanga was akin to democracy. J.P. Sharma, who has worked on the Ganeshangas, has taken a more uh, positive approach. And generally, we find that scholars designate the Ganeshangas as republic or a kind of oligarchical form of government where you have a group of people ruling and within that group, and a, some, a few is the actual ruler. So thus, 
we find that we have different types of opinion regarding the functioning of the state. Romila Thapar feels that if we look at the Ganashangas, it is more like a proto-state. And we had the form of chiefdoms in early India in the Vedic period. And from chiefdoms, we can move into a state where you have the formation of a state without any actual functioning. So she prefers to call it a proto-state. Now regarding the governance or the functioning of the Ganashangas, we find that they are generally organized in an assembly and it's, it's a more like a corporate sector where you have a group of people who, are belong, who belong to the ruling clans. We have two sets, the, we find two sets of names, the Rajakula and the Dasakarmakara. The Rajakulas actually refer to the royal kinsmen and the Dashakarmakaro were the non-kin laborers. So we do not have any middle strata in this whole structure of the Ganashangas type of polity. So while uh, explaining their functioning, we have seen that Buddhist texts talk of an assembly and we have examples of discussions in that assembly. Whenever there was any dissension, then they used to vote for voting. And through voting, uh, they used to come to a positive point. So thus, it was more a decision of a group of people rather than a decision of a single monarch. There would have been ministers to advise the chief of the clan, but the decision of the assembly was final. And therefore, this kind of Ganashangas were little dreaded by the monarchical polity because their main strength was their cohesion. The main strength was their unity. And it is actually this cohesion and this unity which took them along uh, ahead and which could, uh, the, uh, they had the resilience to fight the big monarchical powers through their cohesion. If we look at the Buddhist text, we find that Buddha professed, if the Ganashangas can stay together and if they are cohesive in their attitude, then no power on earth can actually defeat them. But what happened is that when Ajatashatru came to power in Magadha after Bimbisharo, he was very much willing to get the Vrijian confederacy within his fold. Prior to Ajatashatru, Vriji and Bimbisharo were having a good report uh, and so there was no direct conflict between the Magadhan kingdom and the Vrijian confederacy. But when Ajatashotru, with his expansionist policy, he wanted to grab the Vrijian territory, which was in the north of Magadha and which had a very important location trade-wise because it was situated in the lower foothills of the Himalayas where uh, you get a different kinds of resources and it was part of a very important trade route. So Ajatashatru wanted to have control over the Vajian people. Now it was getting very difficult for Ajatashatru to uh, defeat the Vajians because they were very united. He had a minister called Vasakara and this minister met the Buddha and actually wanted the advice of the Buddha so that he could advise his king to fight the Vajian. So when the discussions were going on, Buddha said that it is the unity of the confederacy which keeps them together. And this was taken by Vasakara as a hint. And later on we find that Ajatashatru, in spite of his military strength, actually could defeat the Vajian because he sowed the seeds of discontentment among the different groups of the Ganarajas. We have a text known as Ottokatha, and this text actually talks of this sowing of the seeds of discontention. And Vasakaro went to the Vijayan states. This, he stayed there, and therefore it was possible for Ajatashatru with two kinds of military weapon. He had, for this purpose, he had innovated two kinds of military weapon. One was the Mahakantakoshila, and another was the Rathamushala. Mahakantakoshila is more like a catapult and Rathamoshula is a chariot where you have two maces attached to it. So with this two kind of policy, it was easier for Ajatashatru to get hold of the Vajian confederacy. And moreover, there were internal dissensions and so they, the constant war 
um, with the monarchical powers were difficult for the Vajian people or for this type of Ganeshangas to sustain. When I was talking of Ajato Shotru and his protracted struggle with the Vijayan Confederacy, we were only looking at the Buddhist sources. But it is also very important to take into account the Jaina sources which corroborate the Buddhist sources. For example, in the Jaina literatures, we have references to Ganarajas and it talks about the 18 Ganarajas of Kashi and Koshala along with the 18 groups of Mallas and the uh, 18 groups of Vajins. So you have a confederacy of 36 clans who were together to fight the Magadhans. And from the Jaina text we know that it took actually 16 long years for Ajata Shutru to fight the Vajian confederacy. Therefore, this event should not be looked at as a protracted struggle, but it should be looked at as a policy. And it has been rightly said by H.C. Rai Choudhury that the Koshalan and Vajian war was a policy of Ajata Shutru to get hold of the regions of these two territories. And the whole idea was to actually completely destroy the Ganeshangha type of polity. Didi Kosambi calls this kind of attitude as boring from within. And it was Ajata Shutru who was very uh, adept in this, doing this boring from within and through his idea of bheda, and it is the term that is used in the text is mitu bheda, through his idea of creating dissension, he actually finally overpowered the confederacy of the Vajians. The Ganeshangas talk merely of consolidating their territory. We have references to small skirmishes between two different groups or other between the other groups, but we do not have any example in the text which talks about long down struggle within the Ganeshangas for attainment of power. For example, we do not have any reference where we find that the Vajian Confederacy was trying to control the Mallan Confederacy or the, uh, sh uh, the Shakyas were trying to get hold of the Nyatrikas. So apart from these greater ones, we have some references to some small Ganarajas also. For example, the Nyatrikas uh, were quite important. But there is no effort on the part of the larger Ganarajas to conquer the smaller ones. Now the different texts, for example, the Ottokatha, it gives a huge detail about the story of Ajata Shutru. It talks about how Buddha actually tried to protect the Ganarajas and we have references to the uh, people, uh, for the, to the uh, elites uh, known as the Sethis, the Gahapathis, who were part of the Ganaraja system. And this, when these Ganarajas had their own urban centers, so these Gahapathis, these Sethis became very important. And the, imp the base of these Ganarajas were trade and commerce, and therefore it was very important that the Sethis and Gahapathis played a very important role in the functioning of the Ganarajas. Thus, as mentioned earlier, the economy of the Ganarajas were not in a very precarious position. They, were, they had a strong economy, but they did not know the use of resource extraction or how to mobilize these resources for military purpose, which the monarchical states were adept to. Particularly Magadha was very adept in resource extraction. And this was actually done by Bimbisharo, who had a very strong revenue network. Therefore, overall, if we look at a comparison between the Ganarajas and the monarchical states or the Rajatantra, we find that it is very difficult for the Ganarajas to keep pace with the monarchical states when the kind of, with the kind of functioning they were used to. Another very important factor in the Ganeshanga type of polity is that uh, the control over the land. We find that if you look at the texts, the land was a, a pr property of the clan and they could not, they all had the similar kind of hold over the uh, property. 
Similarly, in case of the lichabes, we find that even a people or a person was also taken to be a property of the clan. For example, we have uh, stories of Ambapali who was not allowed to marry because she was thought to be the property of the Ganarajya. So this kind of uh, attitude of the Ganarajyas later on became detrimental to their success. As I have already mentioned that the Ganashangas had two stratas in the society. There was the Kshatriya Rajakulas and the Dasha Karmakaras. What is important to note is that the Dasha Karmakaras, that is the non-kin laborers, are referred everywhere in the Buddhist texts as persons who were actually doing all the works, but they were never represented in the assembly. And this shows that even in the Ganashanga type of polity, we do not have a, that kind of an egalitarian society which our historians who believed in nationalist ideas wanted to have us believe. So therefore, the Ganashanga was a kind of polity where we have a clear distinction between the elites and the common people and the common people were not given any share in the functioning of the government. It was always the Rajakulas, the members of the royal elites, who had the final say in the running of the administration. Their non-acceptance to the Vedic uh, ceremonies, the non-acceptance to Vedic gods and goddesses is amply proved by the fact that they often had gone for tree worship or they had sacred groves they had different kinds of rituals which were not common to the Vedic rituals. In fact, the, in the Vedic Sutra literature, we have the references to the Dasho Shanshkaras, that is the ten sacraments which a person had to go through right from the conception till the death. And this kind of Dasho Shanshkaras are not practiced in the Ganashanga type of polity. The income that they generated were mainly from agriculture and also from trade. This is very important because when we look at the locations, they were all located in very important trade routes. And therefore, particularly we find that in Northwest India, the Ganashangas of Northwest India in the Punjab, around the five Punjab rivers, they were all very much a part of the larger trade route, which included North India, to West Asia. So we had this grand Uttarapatha which connected the Ganga plains, the foothills of the Himalayas and the Northwest India with countries in West Asia. Therefore this extra impetus of trade gave them enough revenue to sustain. Moreover, in agricultural field, they, since they were located in the low foothills of the Himalayas or in regions nearby to them, so they were more doing wet rice cultivation, which also gave an impetus to agricultural development. So therefore, revenue-wise, they were quite settled. But the problem is that the kind of resource generation which the Magadhan state could do or a monarchical state could do was not possible by the Ganarajya type of polity. So here, finally, when there was a struggle between the Magadhan polity or a type of monarchical polity and the Ganarajyas, their resources were less than this. And so the, they were actually drained out in such kind of protracted struggles, which finally took over their resilience and they succumbed to the monarchical type of polity. Another distinction between the monarchical form of government and the Ganarajyas is that the selection of the ruler. If we look at the monarchical form of government, what we find is that in the monarchical form, it is always ordained that the king is the choice of the gods. So you have this divine right of kingship, divine right theory of kingship, where the king has been selected by the god. Whereas in the Ganashanga type of polity, we have a text known as the Ghanikaya. It talks about the election of ruler and this ruler is said to be elected as a Maha Sammata, which means the great elect. So therefore, it was the 
common people or we can say it was the decision of the clans which actually elected their rulers. So these kind of distinctions were very much prevalent in early Indian scenario. Now when we talk of the 16 Mahajanapadas, we find that there were actually two Janapadas which were very much following the non-monarchical structure. And we have references to others, for example, Kuru, Panchal and others, which were originally monarchical, but later on they became non-monarchical. So it is very uh, intriguing that why a original monarchical form of government, why a Janapada following the original monarchical form of government converts into a non-monarchical form of government. Perhaps the more uh, uh, egalitarian approach of the non-monarchical form of government was responsible for this conversion. Now after the 6th century BC, we find that these gonorajos continued for a pretty long time. Some succumbed to the monarchical powers, but there were others which continued and particularly we have gonorajos in the Punjab rivers, in and around the five Punjab rivers where they lived for a long period. We are, I'm talking about the Yodhyas, the Malavas, the Arjunayanas, the Shanakanaikas. So these kind of gonorajas were very important as a non-monarchical power. Following the Mauryan rule, we find that these gonorajas again came into power. They became very important and they started issuing coins even following the Panchmok type of coins and then they had their own coinage like the cast copper coins or the die struck coins which they issued when they came into contact with the later powers like the Indo Greeks and the Kushanas. So these Ganarajas uh, which actually encountered the Kushana and the uh, Indo Greek powers and started issuing or minting coins in die struck or caste system, they were finally pushed from their original habitat, the five Punjab rivers. We find that these Ganarajas or Ganashangas, they had to move further south into the areas of Rajasthan or into the areas of the Himachal Pradesh where they could find their own identity and were far from the Ganga Valley tradition. As mentioned earlier that the Brahmanical literature talks about them as degenerate Khatriyas or the, as Vratya Kshatriyas. So these people who were not very comfortable in the Varna ideology did not prefer a territory where they were had to follow, where they had to follow the Varnasram Dharma. So naturally the arid plains of Rajasthan which was similar to the Punjab plains and with the mines were more attractive to these people. We have to keep in mind that Panini calls these Shanghas when he was writing his Ashtadhai or in his Ganapatho, he calls these Shanghas as Ayudha Jivi Shanghas. So this means this is a kind of Shangha who actually lives by the use of arms. And for the use of arms, you need a good mineral resources. So you need a metal base where you have enough resources to make your metals or make your weapons. So therefore, these Ayudhajivi groups mentioned by Panini, and we have to remember that Panini has been dated as a pre mauryan author. So he was definitely in Sialkot region in and around 5th century BCE. So it was very easy for this non-monarchical group to come to the Rajasthan region, find a footing for themselves and start staying in this place. Interestingly, if we look at the structure of these Ganesh Rajas, we find that there are different kinds. One was like the Shakyas, the Kaliyas, they are single clan Ganarajas, where actually the family and the chief of the family was the main ruler. But we have again Ganarajas like the Vrishni and the Vajjis, where you have different clan groups ruling together. So 
the Ganaraja experience gave us a wide variety of structures, of political structures, which ancient India uh, saw during the time of the rise of the Janapadas. Thus, when we study the Ganarajas, we find that we have to look at them from the point of view of a polity, which was an, which was an alternative. And I began with that, that Ganarajas were an alternative to kingdom. But at the same time, it is important to note that they were a kind of polity which were running parallelly with the monarchical type of polity. 